caes la glutonal. No caes la glutonal. Te va a tu lado. Já pode iniciar, já. 58. Cadê o zoom? Pega um daquele negócio ali. Vamos guardar na fuzil. Vai do lado, tem dois, né? Aí atrás. Valeu. Tá vendo aí? Interpretar, interpretation. Acho que é. Aí você coloca o start ali. Só que aí. Deixa eu ver. Parece que o cara tem que estar, né? Nós, é, né, não entrou ainda, então não dá para startar. Mas assim que ele entrar, que é o Leomar, acho que alguma coisa, alguma coisa tem lá um chamado que ele quer. Chamado aqui também, ó. Se você clicar, clicar aqui, aqui, ó, aqui está. Lá embaixo, o intérprete tem o nome dele. Léo Alitar. Léo, nossa, que? Amém, que Quase que eu acertei. Já tá gravando já? Já tá gravando. Assim que entrou, já tá gravando. É... Inclusive, a gente tá sendo ouvido pela... Olha lá no Zoom. Olha no Zoom uma
Hudson. Olá, Isabela. Boa noite. Tudo bem? Tudo jóia, você? Tudo jóia. Eu não estou conseguindo conectar pelo meu computador. Eu vou abrir, eu reiniciei aqui de novo. Eu estou pelo meu telefone. Deixa eu ver se eu consigo entrar pela, pelo link que você me mandou, porque o link que eu tenho eu não consegui entrar. Tá jóia. Eu não consigo entrar pelo computador. Mesmo, é, mesmo pelo link não dá, não? Mesmo pelo link, não estou conseguindo. Espera aí, só um segundo. Deixa eu ver se isso aqui é o mesmo. Em qual conta você está conectada? Qual conta? É. Olha, da fundação. Qual o número da, da sua máquina? Deixa eu te falar aqui. É, é, 07866. Só um segundo, vou entrar aí. Você pode dar um pause no, na gravação? Porque a gente está gravando. I called some friends to ask them what they would like to know. So, these three questions. Uh, was like the most one uh, mentioned by the colleagues. So okay, that's why I'm, I'm raising them. Yep, sounds great. Okay, uh, just a quick introduction for everyone. Uh, first, thanks uh, for taking the time to participate on, uh, on this webinar with us. Uh, as we've told on, on the email, uh, Marcelo, he is the professor coordinator of this course. Uh, and well, uh, I can let Marcel introduce, intro, introduce himself. We told about went down a little bit on the, uh, about Marcelo a little bit on email, but I think it's better if you guys uh, also talk a little bit about what you do. Okay, I'm sorry, I did not introduce myself. That was a terrible mistake. Uh, my apologies for that. Okay, I'm Marcelo Brito, uh, Brazilian, linked to agribusiness all my life. You know, my my family comes from from this sector. Uh, I worked uh, 30 years in the oils and fats industry. I lived mm -hmm. in Malaysia and Singapore for quite some time, uh, uh, leading with palm oil as well. So I've been to China many times because of palm oil as well. Uh, I was the CEO of the main uh, palm oil producer in Brazil for quite some time. I left in 2019 and I sat uh, with, with some friends, an investment fund where we are right now investing in the Amazon region in, in uh, social environmental impact uh, investments, uh, mainly in regards of uh, agroforestry systems, uh, cocoa, chocolates, and, and fruits. Mm -hmm. And more recently, helping Fundação Dom Cabral to set up what we're calling the Agribusiness Academy, mm -hmm. the reason why I'm here. So it's a pleasure to to be here with you and, and very nice to, to to finally meet you. Julio told me good things about you. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. Yep, it's great to see you. And you're certainly very not, you, you uh, as uh, most of the people who have been to China many times said, you probably have been to way more places in China than I have, than I have. <laughs> <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> 
<laughs> you you were born in the U.S. or in China? China, uh, Shandong province, oh, northern Shandong. part of China. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, do you want me to make a short introduction of you or you prefer to do yourself? Uh, I, I can do it myself. So I have okay. a slide about it as well. All right, that's great, yeah. Okay, we have uh, 10 minutes, so enough time to grab a coffee and uh, water and then we start, okay? Okay, sounds great. And Mandong, um, we've met before online as well, because you participated in our contrarian agriculture uh, yeah. class, first one. Uh, and uh, when we talk about going to buy, uh, you are always one of the first names that come up into our minds. Uh, and we are planning to be there with uh, this class of students. Uh, they will have one module uh, down in Iowa in July, mm -hmm. end of July. Uh, so I, I think you'll probably already be uh, in Cornell, but maybe uh, if we have time, we can uh, we can man manage to have sure, you as a sure. professor of this class yep. as well. Yep, yep, that sounds good. Yeah, that was our idea. And just also to give you a, a whole uh, idea of who are these students that, uh, that are doing this course. Uh, we have a number of farmers, so I think around uh, 30% of the class uh, is made by farmers and mostly located in uh, Mato Grosso region, Goiás region, and mm -hmm. Middle West Brazil. Uh, right. But we also have people from other industries. So uh, there's one student from Yara, uh, the fertilizer company, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of students from Horsch. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think you probably heard about Michael Horsch as well. So we yeah. have the whole Direct, uh, directors of Horse Brazil participating too. Uh, I think uh, John Deere as well. We have three John Deere students, and well, mostly that, and a couple more from some John Deere dealers too. So it's a, uh, it's a very uh, diverse class. Uh, and then for this live, as we are also using this to promote uh, this course that we uh, have been developing that we are calling the Global Agriculture Academy, um, mm -hmm. we opened uh, this webinar for more people to come in, to come inside and to participate in for all the students to invite also their collaborators and the people they work with and friends. And Marcelo and Julio have also uh, taken the effort to invite more people to come. Sounds great. Uh, I will speak in Portuguese during the presentation, so I think you 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 have the, the uh, full translation from from Leonardo. We have a translator here, Marcelo. Okay. Yes, uh, Marcelo was just telling Mandong about uh, the sort of people that we have here participating, okay. uh, just so he can uh, have a full background. And when everyone uh, is on. We can we can get started. All right. Is the chat open for everyone or only for us? Bella. So everyone. Okay. Wenzong, how is the weather in Iowa right now? It's doing well, and I'm talking with my colleagues, and there are some Iowa farmers that already started planting, even oh, really? this week. Yeah. So and the, to, to our surprise, is some even started planting soybeans. Oh. Uh, so they're, so they're, they're planting this deep in the soil, so it's... Um, because there is still a worry about the early frost potentially in April. So mm -hmm. they haven't really emerged yet. And then they will be, um, um, so they, they have a longer growing days 
and um, so uh, so a couple of farmers, at least we know, tried this technique and achieved higher yields. So they so there it's there. Uh, to our surprise, and people are already uh, thinking about doing well, that. Um, that's, now. that's that's really nice weather for Iowa this time of the year. Yeah. I, I, many times of my life, I, I got heavy snow on, on early April. You know, so, right. uh, nice to hear. I'll call my friends later on. To I think my my kids are running out, outside, so I, I need to remind them. Uh, I will go remind them to not scream too much. All right. Okay. <laughs> Never mind if they do. <laughs> Novinho, ele, né? Sim. Você vê a foto ali que ele está usando, né? Você vê aqueles, esses, esses parques com esses gramados maravilhosos. Né? Eu fico na inveja nisso. Porque você uh -huh. vai lá é desse jeito mesmo, né? Tudo bem cuidado, tudo. tudo assim. Não é Photoshop, é muito verdadeiro. Exato. E não precisa cercar com grade o parque inteiro, né? E fechar às seis da tarde, né? Para não virar um... Não, universidade aberta para todos, né? Exato. Apesar que eu, era como, eu morava perto de Iowa City, eu sou um torcedor da Universidade de Iowa. Então, em termos esportivos, eu sempre fui contrário a esse. Vocês já estiveram lá, não? Na Universidade? Já? Cabi também? Já foi lá? Eu não. Não. Eu fui, a, a, quando eu fui, foi só quando a gente teve a, a, na Farm Progress Show, porque foi uhum. quando eu comecei na Agrobravo, né? Então, foi, uhum. foi os grupos da Farm, a gente também sempre uh, leva o pessoal na universidade, e aí tem o, o Kevin, os professores, eles falam um pouco sobre a agricultura americana e inovação, quando a gente leva lá. E a gente passa uma manhã, faz uma visita no campus e tudo. É sempre uhum. muito legal. Mas uhum. esse programa que o pessoal vai fazer, uh, aí eu, eu nunca fui. Mas tenho muita curiosidade de, de ver. O programa vai, e... vai ser quando mesmo? É a última semana de julho. Julho, né? provavelmente eu não vou conseguir fazer. É uma pena, porque eu vou para a Europa dia 20 de maio, só volto dia 21 de junho. Então... É julho. Junho, mas assim, eu vou ficar um mês fora, né? Depois como é que eu saio de novo? Né? <risos> que eu vou fazer 15 dias de férias e 15 dias de trabalho que eu vou emendar. Sim. É complicado. Finalmente vou conseguir conhecer a casa da minha filha, que já tem dois anos que mora lá e eu nunca fui lá por causa da pandemia. Nossa, é não... Conheceu a família do marido dela, que eu não conheço até hoje, só por, por vídeo. Nossa, é, isso vai ser especial mesmo. É. Nós começamos, vamos começar em ponto? Às 19. Tem muita gente na sala de espera. Tem muita gente na sala de espera. Eu acabei de liberar a sala. Nós já temos 14 pessoas aqui dentro da sala. Eu acho que estar em um minuto.
Vamos lá, Bela? Podemos? Podemos, sim. Bom, boa noite a todos. Prazer tê-los aqui conosco. Em nome da Agrobravo, da Academia Global do Agronegócio da Fundação do Cabral e da Iowa State University, eu quero dar as boas-vindas a todos vocês. É, nós temos a honra hoje aqui de receber o professor doutor Wen Dong Zhang, que vai nos dar um, um overview muito especial é, da importância da China para o Brasil e para os Estados Unidos. A gente tem que lembrar que Brasil e Estados Unidos juntos respondem por, pela maior parte da produção de commodities muito importantes para o mundo, como soja, como milho, algodão, proteína animal. Então, são duas, são duas referências muito grandes do mercado, é, do mercado internacional, tanto na produção quanto no fornecimento. E a China é o maior comprador do Brasil e é o maior comprador dos Estados Unidos. Ao mesmo tempo, é um importante exportador de insumos, tanto para o Brasil quanto para os Estados Unidos. Então, nós temos aqui uma mão de duas vias, como sempre deve ser o mercado internacional. Nós temos tradução simultânea, então, por favor, é, é, quem quiser acompanhar em inglês ou português, é só ir no, no, no link Interpretation, que está aí na base da página de vocês, e clicar e escolher, escolher a, a, a língua é, preferida. Bom, para não perder tempo, nós vamos. Eu já vou passar direto ao professor Dr. Wendong e peço que ele faça uma rápida introdução dele também e, e agradeço a disponibilidade dele de estar aqui com a gente. Professor Wendong, the floor is yours. Great. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm really happy to speak with you, and I hope I, I think I may have uh, spoken with some of you before. It's my pleasure to talk with a group. Again, you are one of my favorite groups, and I wish that we'll be able to see each other in Iowa sometime as well. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about why China matters, and uh, In contrast with Marcelo and my esteemed colleague, like Derma Hayes, that uh, they probably have been to more places in China uh, than I have been. Uh, but uh, when you look at the extension economists in the US across the nation, uh, I'm one of the few who can read a Chinese newspaper. So that's probably my major uh, credentials to speak with you today. Um, so a little more about who I am. Uh, I'm currently an associate professor and extension economist at, at Iowa State University. I got my PhD from uh, Ohio State. Um, but for you that I grew up in a rural uh, county in Shandong province, a northern part of China. If you don't know Chinese geography, so Shandong province is in between Beijing and Shanghai has also across the sea to Korea as well. Um, It's where Confucius was, was born um, 2000 years ago. Um, and um, I actually will be changing jobs. I will be moving to Cornell University in July, but I will be working with on trade and related to Chinese agriculture will continue to be a, an important part of my portfolio. And Cornell also have a center for China economic analysis as well. At ISU, Uh, Derma Hayes and I worked together and set up a center called the China Ag Center at ISU. And I provided the link here and where we written a lot about um, the impacts of China's changing corn policy, astral policy, African swine fever, US-China trade war, and what is the implication for US and global agriculture. And I encourage you to check it out. Um, so these are some of the example articles that we have analyzed. And um, so a few, if you have any questions and suggestions or the consequential topics that you care about, let us know as well. Um, uh, so I have good, we actually have two Brazilian colleagues in the department and uh, I recently hosted one of them and I, He was really impressed about the documentary I showed him. It's about the food in Macau. So I will send that, uh, that link along as well. So you might be interested in seeing some of that too. Um, uh, but I, uh, 
I, I don't know whether Marcelo mentioned early on, if you have questions, feel free to let me know. And I, uh, I want to answer your questions rather than go through the motions and finish all the slides. Okay. Uh, so first I want to mention, um, it is, it is some, somewhat um, unfortunate in a sense, but uh, it's increasingly so that U.S. agricultural trade and uh, agricultural trade with China in general is increasingly tied with political relations. So in that, under, under that assumption, that is we need to pay attention to the political significance of the year we live in. So 2022 is politically significant for both U.S. and China. So in the U.S., there will be a midterm elections and where there will be um, several of the seats that will change, potentially change hands and uh, the ability for President Biden to make major policy uh, decisions after the change, potential change in the seats of U.S. Senate will potentially be even limited. So that will have implication for international policies. And there's in China, there's also wide speculations that the President Xi will at least uh, likely to take on the third term um, and in a way that disrupts the tradition that has been going on for, for the last 20, 30 years. And he's, he, based on the current signal, he's likely to be here um, by probably at least early uh, 2030, if not 2035. So he's definitely one of the consequential world leaders we need to pay attention. And he is increasingly uh, getting involved into more decisions uh, that typically he, the, the president of China doesn't necessarily uh, touch. Um, so one of the signals that you can, you can think about uh, when you are looking at the US-China relations is uh, the date that the two presidents took um, and had a virtual summit. First, that it took almost a year for them to have a virtual summit. The, the summit was held in November 15, 2022. It's almost a year after uh, President Biden and the US took office. And so, and the, which, is, which is really bizarre because that recognizing the significance of the bilateral relations is probably the most important bilateral relations in the world. And it takes typically less than a quarter for the two leaders to find time to, to have a face-to-face -face summit. Um, but it's the fact that it took, took so long is indicative of the likely troublesome nature. Unfortunately, uh, both countries likely will face um, a bumpy relations in, in a decade of, ahead of us. Um, and the bottom figure is a recent video call between the two presidents. Essentially, it's in response to the, the war in Ukraine. Um, but I have a quote from the first interaction. And, but it's just by looking at the, the gestures and the gravity of the facial expressions of the two presidents uh, from November to the current time, you can see this significance uh, and the the, the uncertain world uh, we're, we're, we're living in now. But I wanna take a quote um, from Chinese president's remarks from November, 2022, and try to decipher it a little, a little for you. Um, that the bolded sentence said, uh, China and the United States should respect each other, coexist peacefully and cooperative for a win-win situation. Right. So what does that mean? This has a lot of uh, Chinese political jargon, um, but it's but the, the key significance of the phrase is respect each other, meaning is China no longer view fundamentally that US system is superior uh, than the Chinese system. So, so it's calling on the US to respect the political and governance system of the, uh, the Chinese regime. And notably, the word peacefully is act added after the coexistence as well. So which indicative of real dangers of the potential real um, ideological, uh, technological, 
uh, competition and even potential real armed conflicts, right? So there's there's a need for emphasis that the coexistence needs to be peaceful. Uh, where the agriculture potentially, I think, if you have a more optimistic view, you can see that it's potentially fits into the three, the third bracket. It's it's a the the collaboration in an area of agriculture and agricultural products is the situation where it fits into the criteria for a win-win situation. And later on, we'll describe more, but it's one of the things I want to argue is that uh, despite all the changes that China fundamentally doesn't have the enough resources to be self-sufficient despite these intentions on land intensive agricultural commodities. So they will continue to be uh, increasingly relying on international market and US and Brazil are the two major players in these uh, sphere as well, right? Um, so, so there are some discussion about those and this is the remark about the, the recent interaction about the, the Chinese political stance on the war in, um, in Ukraine. So I wouldn't talk too much about those, but it's the notably that China didn't, um, uh, didn't necessarily call the, uh, the Russians aggression in Ukraine uh, using the word inv invasion. And China and also talked about, uh, criticized the, um, the, the US and NATO's role in potentially setting up this conflict and also the, uh, the, the, the presidents that the US meddling Taiwan and other things, right? So this is, the, the political environment is, is, it's already shifted that when people thinking about the US-China relations and the baseline is sort of already shifted to a bumpier relationship. Um, here is one of the interesting things that when you're looking at, um, MIT has the Observatory of Economic Complexity. So I, the link is uh, listed here. The most recent data coming from United Nations in 2019 shows, shows you um, on the left, where the country, what are the countries that the China is buying from? So. Uh, Brazil is representing about 4% of all the Chinese imports, but it's, if you're looking at the, the commodity breakdown, soybeans, crude oil, and iron ores are the major things that, that China bought from Brazil. So agricultural, uh, agricultural exports are fairly significant uh, in these trade relations. Uh, by looking at the, what China imports from Ukraine and Russia, you could also see that this is uh, the the outsized influence of ag agricultural products in the U.S. in the China and Ukraine relationship. Uh, when you are looking at that, all the products that the China buys from Ukraine, uh, twenty percent of those are almost um, accounts are, are corn. In 2019, so those accounts for about eighty percent of the corn inputs uh, imports that China had in that year. And that ratio dropped um, to 30%. I will show you the more recent numbers for 2020. And when you are looking at the relationship, trade relationship um, China had with Russia, uh, crude oil, natural gas, and these energy products are very significant as well, right? So of significance in terms of um, the Chinese trade was, uh, with Russia and Ukraine, the Ukraine exports of agricultural products probably are the things that, that potentially see most disruption and uh, likely will send positive signals in terms of uh, what the US and Brazil could potentially uh, do in terms of substitute, right? Uh, so I, I can comment on a little more about those. Here are some more recent data about China's corn imports in 2021. And uh, almost 70% is coming from uh, US and 29% is coming from Ukraine. And this is in part related to US-China phase one deal. So later on, we'll com comment a little bit more on that. And that concluded now, right? So during this time, when you are looking at the charts on the right, this shows you the quantity and the share that, of the corn that's coming from Ukraine 
um, from China's perspective. So the red bar shows you um, the essentially 10,000 metric tons as the units. So uh, seven, about 7 million metric tons of Ukraine corn were imported by China in the year 2021. And those account for about 30% of all things that China bought. And notably, and China's uh, tariff rate, rate quota is about that uh, level, right? So it's about 7 million metric tons. So they imported a lot more. The disregarded the uh, tariff rate, rate quota in the year of 2020, 2021. Uh, in part, it's because the hog herd are expanding, so they need more feed grains. Uh, but also, this is because that China has phase one trade deal, so they also wanted to buy more product from the U.S. as well. The current signal is that China want to honor the tariff rate quota, so the quantity of the corn imports in China uh, coming from China from all countries are much more, much less compared to uh, before. Uh, when you are thinking about uh, when you are thinking about the um, the typical year before 2020, China imports about five million um, um, uh, metric tons, and so when that was 80 some percent, it's coming from Ukraine. So Ukraine does represent a significant source for Chinese corn. In the grand scheme of things, that China still want to maintain a 95 percent or higher. Um, self-sufficiency ratio for for corn because they are still in a on the fence in terms of considering uh, corn as one of the major food crop. Um, there are room um, for that shifting stance because that China started to experiment GM corn production in certain provinces. They start to increasingly recognize corn is uh, not only a food crop but also more importantly as a feed crop and um, an energy crop, which they're more open to the international markets. So I think they're gradually more probably, they're, they're, they're more open to um, opening the corn market to the global market. Um, so the, the war that is happening in uh, Ukraine potentially could change the stance uh, in China later on this year to, to increase the quantity, but it's because the domestic pork prices are fairly low and then the demand are hurt. Um, they also imported a lot uh, last year. So far, we don't necessarily see the signal yet. Um, so uh, there, as part of the rocky political relations um, that President Biden uh, were pressured to consider lifting tariffs imposed on Chinese products. And if you know the US-China trade war, the trade war is in a way still going on because a lot of the hundreds of billions of products are still under tariffs, uh, but those are not necessarily removed because that will be viewed as uh, being too soft on China. And if you're looking at the agricultural exports, so this chart shows you uh, fairly messy charts, but it's, if you pay attention to the different colors, um, the green line, the green line shows you this is a benchmark year of 2017. So China bought about 20, 22, 25 billion dollars of agricultural products from the U.S. And ways of phase one deal in red line, which is the 2020, in the year 2020, uh, there's a gap uh, in. January to March because China had coronavirus, so they had uh, that affected their ability to buy more. So the takeoff uh, in purchasing Brazil and U.S. products probably didn't take off until later that year, and reached a break record-breaking quantities of buying over five billion dollars every month from the U.S. and the blue bar representing the year of and. The purple line represents the current uh, January 2022 okay. signal is still at the very high watermark. Um, all the US politician probably will be um, applauding the phase one deal as the major sources for this success. Uh, but I think that when you are looking at what is a major economic fundamentals 
are the African swine fever and the recovery of the hog herd and this demand for feedstock and also the gap that you know, because the African swine fever, China cannot produce enough pork. So they bought a lot more beef and pork from the US. Um, um, so those are probably some of the major factors too. So here are some of the same- What went down? Went down. On the breakdown. Went down, please, let me interrupt you. Uh, oh, thank you, Luis, for uh, shutting down the, the Mac. Okay, went down. Great. So here, Sorry. if if you're looking at the uh, the U.S. weekly ag exports, um, the red line showing you the current year exports. So for uh, for soybean and corn on the left, it shows you the marketing year. So starting from so we are in a, uh, starting September. Um, on the right, it's a protein, beef and pork. Those are 2021. So you can see that the soybeans are. Uh, probably a, a 300 million bushels less uh, compared to 2021, but it's still probably above the five-year average. So it's strong, but it's not record-breaking. Corn is it's lagging, especially between September to January, with the uncertainty that is coming from uh, Ukraine um, that China have ramped up some of the pace in buying corn, um, but it's still probably not as strong as what we see in, uh, in, in a year before. Uh, with the conclusion of the African swine fever hog recovery, the pork purchase have slowed down because they want to produce the pork uh, domestically. Uh, but the income growth, I think, it's considering that the beef accounted for a much a shorter, uh, smaller share of the protein demand in China, this are continuing and it's, it's um, much more percentage growth, right? So later on, I'll show you that it's, this is in part because the Chinese diet, in the Chinese diet, beef is not a very, very significant um, a portion of the meat that people eat. 60% uh, of the meats that Chinese people eat are pork. Right, so, so pork is a, probably a major deal, but it's the beef is more pricier item that is tighter to tie to more uh, to income groups. Right. So uh, when you are thinking about the, um, the general US China phase one deal, um, the agricultural products purchases are probably close to the target, a little behind the target, uh, but it's, what is it really the gap are coming from are coming from the energy products and manufacturing products. And so they're in inside the US, there also a criticism about Chinese failing to meet these targets. Uh, there are even senators talk, talking about imposing further tariffs on Chinese products as a, as a response for, for those assessment. Um, but I think those are probably politically challenging in a sense that if you read the 80 some page uh, agreement, um, they, are, they have sort of the escape clause uh, built in because that the Chinese purchase are set to be based on um, commercial prices, uh, the market prices and uh, has to be weighed in through commercial considerations. And one of the critics, one of the rebuttal that China's government could potentially have is that the COVID led to a decrease in energy prices for 18 months. And even if I buy uh, the same quantity of the energy, energy products, uh, you will still not be able to achieve this value bar. Uh, and that said, and these guard, these additional purchases have never been achieved before. If you look at this charts, this black dashed line on the target from the phase one deal, um, before 2021, they are never achieved uh, in reality before. So, so even if we are getting only 80, 85% of to that bar, uh, it's already uh, breaking the historical records, right? So the farmers are, um, are happy in terms of the quantity, but it's a lot of the things are probably not necessarily driven by phase one deal, but it's driven by internal Chinese market forces and the African swine fever. At, at the same time, uh, Germany also had African swine fever. So we US and lost one of the competitors too. Um, so, um, 
So I want to shift the gear a little bit in case there are questions. Um, okay, so um, I mentioned early on that when you are looking at looking at the um, the font the future of U.S. and Chinese agricultural trade and Brazil China agricultural trade, uh, you it's it's uh, useful to look at the fundamentals that China is dealing with. This is the Chinese map overlaid with the lower 48 states with uh, not Beijing, it's my hometown is showing as a red star here. I will show you a little bit more about the economic transformation. And this is also Iowa highlighted, right? So my notably that China roughly covered the same land area as the United States and slightly larger actually. And uh, more importantly, this also covers the similar latitude ranges. So when you are thinking about uh, the same natural um, natural forces that drive the crop production patterns and China Chinese farmers face similar kind of things as well. So my hometown area denoted by the star here has the same latitude with Kansas. So Kansas, is a major wheat production region in the US. And that's where my uh, grandpa's village has been growing for thousands of years, right? So they have been growing wheat and corn, double crops. Um, and when you are thinking about um, uh, another thing is when you are looking at the Chinese map, um, if you look just look at the total land area, you, you will be mistaken that you think that China has a lot of land and they must have enough resources um, to self-sustain. But it's, unfortunately, if you're looking at the Chinese geography, uh, if you draw a line between the northeast corner of the Chinese map with the southwest corner here, right? So on the western portion, it's very hard for people, animal, and crops to live. You have a bunch of deserts. Uh, you have the Tibet, which is uh, 12,000 feet or above. 90% of the population live east of that line. So this is the population density. And if you see a pool of red, that means there's about 100 million people in those regions, right? So this, this area is, uh, is Sichuan, where the pandas live and where the spicy food are famous for, right? And if you, another thing of thinking about why China matters for US and Brazil agribusiness, for example, is I give you two, uh, two examples that is related to myself, right? So my last name, Z-H-A-N-G, there are a hundred million people who have the same last name. Um, and when my wife's last name, W-A-N-G, has another 100 million people who have the same last name, right? So those are the, the market size you're thinking about. And I mentioned I'm coming from a rural county in, in the northern part of China, in Shandong province. And my rural county has a million people, right? And I, when I talk about this in Iowa, I recognizing that the Iowa only has 3 million people for the entire state. Right. So this is the 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 the, fun, the fundamentals are different, but is but these many people living in the same tight places where the crops and livestock are also fighting for space is not necessarily good for land intensive production in terms of commodity agriculture. Right. So China cannot be self sustaining in all the commodity what they want to be. So essentially, China. Um, uh, concentrate and focused on food crop, which is mainly wheat in the middle and rice in the south. And they currently in the transitional period are thinking about corn in the northeast. Uh, they're still holding pretty tight there. And they're, I think there are some shifting signs there. Uh, when you are thinking about these production on the left, this is the um, so uh, maybe on, on the right is easier to see. So the yellow is corn, uh, orange is wheat, and in a, in a south is rice, right? Um, but these are the uh, agricultural and uh, these are the crops. But it's, if you're looking at on the left figures and pay attention to maybe uh, the, where the 
uh, the red color is that's the meat production. So you see a lot of the red in the southern part, and those are the pork production are in the eastern and southern part of China, where you notice that those are the urban centers are. So the China's agricultural facilities are facing hefty and increasingly stringent environmental regulations as well. And those are the area that sometimes doesn't necessarily have the land base. That's why that you're seeing the high rise buildings in the livestock, um, uh, seven, eight story uh, hog buildings too. And the increasingly you see a lot of the values are, are allocated to the gray area, which is vegetables. So the land is also increasingly be taken up in the peri-urban area uh, to reserve for vegetable production as well. And later I have some personal examples to show you too. Um, uh, as, as we're focusing on the US-China trade war, one of the things that um, China responded is China when, when, when to the world essentially try to strengthen ties with US competitors. So oh, during the progression of the US-China trade war, the average tariff between US and China increased from about 8% to 20%. And currently they are still there and there are some exemptions for exports, but the trade war is still not ending. Um, at the same time, the dashed line represents the Chinese tariffs on competitors, and this has actually decreased from 8% to 6.7, 6.5%, right? So they're trying to strengthen ties with other partners through Belt and Road initiatives, through the trade agreement. So one of the trade agreement is called RCEP, so Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, so which includes the 10 uh, East Southeast Asian countries and also includes China, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, right? So this, this agreement for the first time created sort of the free trade ties between South Korea and Japan and also China and Japan. So, so those are some of the things that is uh, not necessarily very meaningful for Brazil, but it's if you are fruit growers, and you will be impacted significantly through those. And this also affects the rice trade significantly as well, right? Um, so if you are thinking about um, zooming in, looking at what sort of the stuff that China uh, buys and um, in addition buys from Brazil, right? So this is on the left, it shows you uh, what China sells to Brazil. On the right, it shows you what Brazil sells to China, right? So you can see that a lot of the um, telecommunication, uh, so electronic stuff that is coming from China, um, and you don't see a whole lot of uh, uh, yellow, which is the agricultural products in the Chinese exports to Brazil. But the raw material, we have seen this before, the raw materials um, uh, from Brazil and crude oil and soybeans, are very significant uh, exports for Brazilian producers. So I think that this is this is sort of indicative that there are mutually beneficial uh, trade relationship through this as well. Because when you are thinking about the, um, the, the from the China's perspective, they don't have land to be self-sufficient in all the uh, commodities. So they essentially made the strategic decisions to give up uh, soybean. So, so far, the China can only produce less than 20% of the soybean needs uh, for, for its domestic, uh, from its domestic production, and 80% is coming from Brazil and, um, and U.S. fundamentally, and that represents about 60% of the U.S. soybean exports and over 75% of the soybean exports uh, from Brazil, right? And here, it's when you are looking at the more broadly by on a country basis that China is also the é. top one. Aí tu fez isso para ninguém. A top one export destination and import origin country as well. So the the ties are strengthening, and you can also see that uh, those are some of the things that is not only in. In Brazil, but it's uh, not only uh, not only on agricultural products, but it's also in 
a related a related infrastructure investment um, as well. So one of the things uh, I often got, got asked is about China's Belt and Road Initiative, um, especially that the COVID and a lot of the criticism through the Chinese company not necessarily utilizing local labor or paying a fair wage for the for the local labor through these projects or the lo the, the financing with the host countries have draw a lot of the criticism, but I think that those are still going. And when you are thinking about that uh, a recent highway between China and Laos, which is a Southeastern Asian country, um, that just opened about uh, November last year. And this essentially cut the travel time in Laos from two days to about three hours, right? So those are the significance and after probably six years of the Chinese construction team working through the mountain passes and working on those, they are not only working in that particular country, right? So um, my colleague Gil de Pola from Brazil and I, we are actually working on research papers looking into um, uh, Brazil's transportation infrastructure and how this uh, related and coupled with the trade reforms, how this related to agricultural production and economic growth in general. And on the left, you can see that this is the municipality level distribution of soybean production in 1980 and 2017. You can see the significance of Mato Grosso now, right? And, and there's also the the, the BR-163 and uh, different ports as well. And we have also written in an article that the transportation costs are often the bottleneck in the, uh, the Brazilian soybean exports. And we are thinking about the recent improvements in the transportations on average have, uh, that have improved the competitiveness of the uh, Brazilian grains, right? So. Um, the production cost, uh, so, 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 so becoming more and more competitive to, to the U.S. counterparts, um, especially with the new trade routes and uh, through ports and, um, and the roads as well, right? So we are, we are actively working on uh, these issues. And the Chinese companies, I know, have invested in uh, Brazil and also played a role in the construction of the stadium during the Olympics there as well, right? So, so the, the, the Chinese companies are also definitely um, nudged by the U.S.-China trade war and want to get more involved and to, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the arena of the U.S. competitors as well, right? So another thing I want to emphasize is um, there is a lot of discussion about the slowing and uh, slow growth and um, aging Chinese population, but I think I also want to remind you that when you are thinking about the um, agricultural exports, that income growth is also very important, right? So this is the the when you are looking at the population projection that Chinese population will be getting older, much older. So there is a financial burden in caring for the old. Um, so the total number of the Chinese people probably will peak sometime in the next 10 years and uh, will actually decline when we're looking at 2040 and 2050. Um, but when you are looking at the income growth, those are probably uh, very significant. We have done analysis when people move across from the low income to lower to, to higher income, the share of the products that is that the people tends to buy more is the increasingly in the yellow colored one, it's a consumer oriented uh, agricultural exports product. So there is a, there, there, are, there are shifts in terms of the quantity, the quality of the products that people buy. One of the example we have talked about earlier uh, is beef, right? So uh, when you are looking at the exports, US exports to the world, um, the beef is comparable, but as a lot of the increase are actually lifted by the Chinese demand. And these seems to be going fairly strong as well. And those are not necessarily tied with population growth. Those are tied with income growth, right? So I talked about the, on a per capita basis, um, the, if you're looking at the 
beef consumption, you should pay attention to the orange color. They're not a whole lot. So on average, the Chinese people only eat about over 100 pounds of meat uh, on an annual basis. And 60% of those are pork. And the beef are not a very, very significant. But on average, um, say 20% of the people eat, um, eat five pounds of beef more, on average, this will translate into 1.3, 1.4 billion people eating one pound of beef every year more. And those translate into these gigantic um, international market movements as well, right? So, so these are driven by income growth. And you can also see that the imports of Chilean cherries, which is noticeably larger that you can brag to your neighbors. And I, I, I have income now and I can buy this, you cannot, right? So, so those are, have skyrocketed in China as well, along with avocado over the past 10 years. Um, so I, I, I will go very quickly about some of the things that is interesting um, that that uh, you may you, you may not fully aware. So on the left, this is the high speed rail map, and notice notice this is. Uh, I left in China in two thousand nine to go to PhD schools uh, to to go for PhD. None of those are there, right? So in two thousand nine, if you, I go to my um, uh, state state capital to Shanghai, it takes about a, uh, 11, 10 hours. And the same route with high-speed rail is only taking three and a half hours for the same route. On the right is where the industry upgrading the African swine fever sort of um, led to is that China recognized a lot of the meat originally were transported through live pigs. And this is more prone to disease risk. And they're building the code co-chain uh, networks to transport more meat rather than animals uh, as well. So those are some of the, the changes. Uh, here, I mentioned that my hometown has been in the wheat country at the same latitude with Kansas, but it's, this is my uncle holding his grandson. Uh, everyone in my grandpa's village are growing vegetables in high tunnel greenhouses. Right, so those are the economic transformations because they are only uh, four, uh, four or five hours south of Beijing. So their, uh, their vegetables go to Tianjin and Beijing, which uh, each has more than 20 million people. And also the honeydews in those also go to Korea and Japan. And so and China also, I think, uh, especially emphasize for the US audience that Unfortunately, due to the economic, the, the political relationship, the the coverage, the media coverage about China will be increasingly negative. Uh, but it's when you are looking at the the agricultural markets and what China is doing, in general, China is becoming more market oriented rather than less. And uh, there, so there's a lot of push on um, the CRISPR technology and there's uh, signs of China want to push for GM production of corn uh, as well. Uh, so I can talk about those if you have uh, questions. Um, I will skip this for now um, um, about the Chinese economic, um, China's, uh, China's uh, the governance hierarchy. And um, so there are a lot of, there, there is a lot of heritage. You should pay attention not only to the ideological side of the regime, but also pay attention to the historical linkage uh, of how, how things are dying in China. And the Chinese, those are often more telling forces than uh, looking, at, look, looking at China as a, you know, oppressed uh, communist regime, right? So with that, I will have three books for you. Uh, to consider learning more about China. If you haven't traveled um, uh, traveled in China, uh, definitely I think is worthwhile. Um, and these are the three books that covers different aspects of China. The first book is talking about the US and China uh, diplomatic and people to people relationship over the past 200 years. And uh, the center book talk about the Chinese economy in general is sort of a used as a textbook. On the right is talking about by uh, a well-known 
uh, agricultural economists talk about the rural nutrition and the life and health conditions of Chinese kids in rural part of China. Um, and so I will stop there and see whether you have any questions. Wendel, muito obrigado. Brilhante a apresentação. É, obrigado por essa dica que você deu. Né? É, não nos analisem apenas pelo regime ideológico, mas pelo nosso senso histórico. Isso é muito importante, porque nós temos a tendência de fazer uma análise da Ásia, ou mesmo somente da China, ou da Ásia em geral, sob o ponto de vista ocidental, e às vezes até sob o nosso ponto de vista é, aqui do Brasil. E, e, e geralmente a gente erra muito, justamente porque são são maneiras e pensamentos muito, muito, muito diferentes. É, nós temos aqui algumas perguntas, eu quero começar com a pergunta do Wilson Bispo. É, how not being in the Asia-Pacific Agreement could harm Brazil's poultry exports? Is in the chat. Okay, right. Yep. So, how not being in the Asia Pacific Agreement could harm um, uh, Brazil's poultry exports? I th I think so. The uh, there are still a lot of potential uh, when you are thinking about the um, um, when African swine fever hit China. China bought a lot more um, pork, poultry, and beef uh, from all over the country, uh, all over the world. And so when you are looking at the, the RCEP, the poultry is not necessarily the major products that they are, um, they're interested in. So a lot of the major products that the, uh, the covered in those countries are fruits and vegetables and rice, uh, and also that the dairy product coming from Australia and New Zealand. So poultry not necessarily is a, will be a major uh, competitor coming from those countries. Um, China has, um, uh, that said, the, the China has um, played up the trade rhetoric in, in trade relationship with the U.S. because the poultry products that China imports are often chicken feet and those uh, sort of the, not necessarily uh, all uh, necessary, right? So they, if they want to switch and they want to punish the U.S. in 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 a case of um, the trade war in 2010, the U.S. imposed tariff on Chinese tire. China essentially uh, banned the poultry exports from the U.S. Right? So these are not necessarily the major quantity that China imports in. So those are um, more prone to. Uh, political and disease risk um, like that. But it's, I think that uh, there's still potential that this particular agreement doesn't necessarily affect that pro uh, prospects that much. Obrigado. Uh, uma segunda pergunta do nosso amigo Paulo Teles, está no chat também. Uh, you, you are, uh, você já falou sobre isso, né? sobre a questão territorial, é, que não é propícia para a agricultura. Uh, but uh, a part important, what is China doing to reduce depending on importing of food? Right. So, um, right. So, what China is doing to reduce to re dependence? Dependence. On right. 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 Dependence. Um, so, I think what China is doing several things. One is that China, is, uh, I, I alluded to in in a slide that. China is investing heavily in the CRISPR technology. So they, they see a significant yield gap between the Chinese production with the US production. So on average, corn and soybean yields on average in China are only probably 60% of the US levels. Uh, so they wanna close the yield gap so that they can increase uh, production efficiency. At the same time, they're also um, they're, they're also trying to be, uh, be more efficient in devoting acres to the products and they, they, uh, they describe as uh, with national food security significance, right? So, uh, so they wanna use the acres um, um, in the area for the food crop, wheat and rice, right? So they are willing to give up uh, feed grains like, uh, like, um, like soybeans. 
Right, but you are you're right that the weather is not necessarily uh, right. So China, at the same time, faced a lot of challenges in uh, overdrawing groundwater, um, uh, groundwater from um, uh, in the northern part of China. So so there are there are a lot of challenges. So that's why I think that despite the rhetoric, China cannot be self sufficient in a lot of things. At the same time, China is also encouraging. Uh, reduction in food waste, right? So there's um, similar efforts in the US as well. So that's part of the things um, that China is doing, but it's a technology uh, um, uh, improvements and the uh, China also didn't have extension system as in the US land grant university. So there are more, more efforts uh, to, to improve the communication and information technology and uh, equipment and production efficiency in China as well. Right. And I saw uh, in the chat, uh, there is a question. Uh, yeah. Antes da pergunta do Danilo, eu queria fazer uma outra pergunta que, que, que vai entrar junto com essa dele. Tá? E a pergunta é o seguinte, é, é, durante, nessa semana nós tivemos é, artigos no mundo inteiro, e eu, eu li um da Bloomberg, falando sobre a enorme quebra de produção que a China vai ter em função das questões climáticas do ano passado, né? e não foi seca, foi excesso de água, né? excesso de chuva, é, e com quebras bastante significativas em arroz, em trigo e em milho, né? com uma, uma produtividade caindo em mais de 8%, e nas palavras do ministro da Agricultura chinês, talvez a maior quebra é, 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 da história. Tá? Se a gente olha essa quebra na produção local, e também entrando na pergunta do Danilo, considera os atrasos dos embarques marítimos dos Estados Unidos, você acredita que o Brasil tem alguma vantagem competitiva no suplemento dessas commodities, especificamente soja e milho com a China nesse ano? Uh... For for corn, uh, I think there are there there are potential, uh, but I think that the, the the U.S. is sort of more dominant in the corn market. I think, given the situation in in Ukraine, I think probably U.S. will benefit more. But it's uh, definitely, I think Brazil could see more potential for increase. But it's, as as you mentioned, I think the the general thesis is correct that. China is so big now, increasingly we see the domestic production disruptions or domestic policy changes. Uh, say in 2016, they ended the uh, uh, corn support price policy, which led to significant reduction in, in the corn prices in, uh, inside China. Before that, because the price gap that China imported a lot more corn, barley, uh, from all other countries, right? So um, typically the self-sufficiency ratio is China to try to achieve 97 or 99% or more for wheat and rice, right? So if the 8% is realized, they will be prepared for about three, four percent of those gap in the in the in the state reserves, which means that they probably will will double the size of the import imports they would otherwise have. Uh, but it's, I think now uh, I also want to caution that the um, now even even China's sea technology is it's worse compared to Brazil and uh, the US. Um, over time, we see the resilience of the sea to these natural events uh, seems to be getting more resilient. And we have analyzed the weather shocks in uh, in July 2020, for example, uh, China's in central part of China and also in even northern part of China also had floods as well. So eventually only got affected probably less than 1% of the production. Uh, so it didn't cause a major reaction in the global market. But I think that, but this time seems to be a larger effects than that. So I think those, those are some of the things that, uh, especially for, uh, for for corn uh, for for wheat and those are probably less impacted because China want to uh, store more for those food products, uh, but I think that the, the disruption definitely will cause uh, global reactions too. 
Uh, Wendon, para encerrarmos, uma, uma última pergunta geopolítica. É, nós já sabemos pelas projeções que 60% da classe média mundial consumidora em 2030 estará na Ásia, que responde hoje por quase 60% das exportações do agronegócio brasileiro. E, potencialmente, a maior parte desse, dessa classe média consumidora está na China, que representa hoje mais de 40% das exportações do agronegócio brasileiro. Só que nós temos um problema. De toda essa enorme exportação para a China, cinco produtos representam 95% de tudo que nós exportamos para a China. E nós assistimos, nesse momento, a China fazendo... Naturalmente, vai ter uma quebra agora por conta da guerra russa ucrânia mas nós temos assistido a expansão do, da, que a China vem fazendo na sua base de, sufri, de suprimentos para a Ásia, na Ásia, na África e também no norte da Europa e no leste europeu. No longo prazo, essa extensão da base de, sofri, de, de, de suprimento da China, como você acha que irá impactar o Brasil, até pela nossa posição geográfica, que é mais longe da China do que todos esses países que eu me referi? Right. So, so I, I think first I, I agree with you that if, if you look at the Brookings Institution report that uh, over 80% of the next billion middle class will be in Asia. Right? So China will be a significant portion of that. And I, 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 I tell the same story that it's the, the same, the, the US exporter has the same worry, I think, um, that I encourage the US uh, exporters to think about Uh, diversify more diversification and more market share in terms of the consumer goods in uh, wine and beer products from California and the cheese products maybe from Wisconsin. Similarly, I think for Brazil as well, you're right that the China, from China's perspective, they definitely want to be more diversified. Uh, but unfortunately, I think when you're looking at the bulk commodity, there's not a whole lot of places to for you to be diversified too, right? So Eastern Europe and including um, uh, uh, Ukraine is part of the diversification, diversification strategy that China want to take, right? So I think that uh, when you are thinking about the, uh, the, the Brazilian exports to, to China, uh, thinking about uh, beyond um, soybeans and whether um, uh, Brazilian proteins like beef can make a, a, a Uh, a larger share in China's growing demand? And are there um, uh, wine products or consumer products that is potentially can be more appealing? Um, and when, you, when you are thinking about um, the whole portfolio and whether the second, second crop of corn, especially China has the ethanol policy that is still debating whether they want to use corn for ethanol production. So those could be potentially be consequential as well. Um, I, I think that overall, when you are thinking about a diversified approach, that is definitely more um, reliable, but, it's, but this is related to one of the earlier questions um, that Andre has, that from China's perspective, what makes Brazil a more reliable and preferred egg supplier? I think the Brazilian exports has a unique advantage compared to the US is, is It has way less political disruptions. And so because that when, when, when US and China often uh, with the bumpy economic relations, there will be something that, is, that might, be, might go wrong. And because the US sell way more agricultural products to China than China sells agricultural products for, to the US, often unrelated events like the tires and other things will lead to retaliation from China on agricultural products, right? So Brazil arguably don't necessarily have those issues. I, I also think that, 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 that to the extent that the, the Brazil and China could collaborate to improve the transportation connectivity, um, so that could, could also improve the competitiveness of uh, the Brazilian exports as well. Um, but overall, I think that the um, there's also a question about, right, so 
uh, do you believe Brazil will have some advantage in terms of the supplier of choice of commodity for soybeans and maybe corn? I think again that there the if if the the Chinese buyers want to want to uh, want to buy from these countries, they they are not they they consider these political risk, but it's also they care a lot about the prices, right? So it's improving the transportation cost will help with the cost competitiveness. And, and I think that especially for the bulk commodities like the feed grains and soybeans, and those will be very consequential and uh, Brazil will be really hard to replace. Um, we are also currently doing research related to how the movements in low carbon fuels and especially the demand for renewable diesel could potentially change the soybean and soybean meal market in the US and globally. I think those are some of the things and also worth watching as well and how that affects the global trade patterns, not only about soybean as a whole bean, but also soybean meal and soybean oil as well, right? So those are some of the things that is increasingly important that is shape, uh, shaping the, the demand as well. Hey, professor, Dr. Wendong, um prazer imenso. Muito obrigado. Foi uma aula para nós. Se eu pudesse fazer um wrap-up em 20 segundos aqui, eu acho que as palavras que você nos deixa, é, primeiro, é, não olhemos somente a próxima safra, vamos olhar daqui 10 anos na frente, 20 anos na frente, saibamos planejar, precisamos diversificar, eu acho que você foi muito claro nessa colocação, precisamos fazer conexões internacionais, relações internacionais, estar nos acordos multilaterais, coisa que nós não fizemos durante os últimos 30 anos no Brasil, e estar muito atento que a base de suprimento da China vem se ampliando. Então, nós precisamos fazer as modificações internas do nosso país para que o agro possa ser vibrante na próxima década e na próxima e na próxima. O grau de valorização e de agregação de valor do agronegócio brasileiro hoje equivale ao do agronegócio americano há 80 anos atrás. Então, ou seja, se nós estamos muito bem na produção dentro da fazenda, na relação final do agronegócio, nós ainda temos muito para evoluir. E lembrar que num país onde só o agro cresce, mas a indústria e o serviço diminuem, decrescem, é um país fadado ao fracasso. Só cresceremos se todos os setores crescerem concomitantemente. Obrigado a todos os presentes. Mais uma vez, em nome da Agro Bravo, da Academia Global do Agro, da Fundação do Cabral, da Iowa State University, ao querido professor Dr. Wendong Zhang. Muitíssimo obrigado e nossas saudações por dividir o seu conhecimento aqui com todos. Uma boa noite a todos. Muito obrigado e até a próxima. Thank you very much. Excellent su summary, Marcelo. I think that, that that's wonderful. And uh, the, the only thing uh, I want to add is I think that one of the disadvantage that um, Brazilian agribusiness had is probably that most, most Chinese people don't speak Portuguese. So uh, if yeah. the, you need more people who uh, are willing to learn Chinese, that, that potentially will help uh, build confidence true. in the past, yeah. I think. This is true. Well, no, thank you so much. Really nice to have you here with us, and hopefully we can get together very soon. I wish you all the best in Cornell. Great success. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Keep in touch. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Meninas, obrigado, Bela, Gabi. Obrigada, Marcelo.